A small familiar airplane lifts off from a quiet grass runway in Florida. The engine is producing power. The instruments look normal. There is no warning, no failure, no sudden emergency. But the airplane becomes airborne late, very late, and it never truly begins to climb. Just seconds after leaving the ground, it strikes trees beyond the runway. Tonight, we're going to carefully reconstruct how this happened, not by looking for a dramatic failure, but by examining how a sequence of ordinary everyday performance decisions gradually removed margin after margin until the airplane reached a point where recovery was no longer possible. This is not a story about something breaking. It's a story about how close to the edge an airplane can get without anyone realizing it until there's no space left. This accident involved a Beechcraft C-23 Sundowner registration November 6009 uniform. The Sundowner is a deliberately simple airplane. It's normally aspirated with fixed landing gear and straightforward systems. It was designed to be predictable, stable, and easy to operate an airplane that rewards basic airmanship rather than constant management. Many pilots think of aircraft like the Sundowner as forgiving. And in many ways they are. They don't surprise you easily. They don't demand aggressive control inputs. They tend to behave exactly the way the manuals say they will. That's important because it tells us something fundamental. This airplane was not hiding a trap in its systems. What happened here did not come from complexity. On board were three occupants, including 76-year-old Carl C.J. Powell and Jeff Thomas. All three occupants were fatally injured. The flight departed from Spencer's Air Park, a private, non-towered grass strip in Florida, and was intended to be a local flight. There is no indication of a time-critical mission deteriorating weather or external pressure pushing the departure. And now it's worth clearly stating what investigators did not find, because that absence is just as important as any presence. There was no mechanical failure identified. The engine was producing power at impact. The propeller showed signatures consistent with rotation. There was no flight control malfunction. No evidence of control restriction or pre-impact damage that would have prevented normal operation. There was no indication of pilot incapacitation. No medical event. No distraction caused by an abnormal cockpit situation. This was not a flight that suddenly turned into an emergency. Instead, it was a flight that quietly ran out of performance during the most unforgiving phase of flight takeoff. And to understand how that can happen, we need to stop thinking in terms of right and wrong actions and start thinking in terms of margins. Takeoff performance doesn't begin with the throttle. It begins with the runway. Spencer's Air Park consists of a grass runway approximately 3,800 feet long, with a measurable slope totaling about 40 feet of elevation change between runway ends. On paper, that length sounds comfortable for an airplane like the Sundowner. But performance is never determined by length alone. Grass surfaces behave very differently from pavement. Grass bends under the tires. It increases friction. It absorbs energy that would otherwise go into acceleration. From the cockpit, this is deceptively subtle. The airplane still accelerates. The engine still sounds normal. There's no obvious indication that anything is wrong, but acceleration is slower than it would be on pavement, and that difference compounds over distance. If the grass is soft, uneven, or slightly tall, that resistance increases further. Each rotation of the wheels demands more energy just to keep moving. The manufacturer understood this very clearly. The Beechcraft Sundowner Pilot Operating Handbook includes separate takeoff performance charts specifically for grass surfaces. That's not a suggestion, it's an acknowledgement that grass meaningfully changes the takeoff equation. And this is where many pilots, especially at familiar fields, can unconsciously shift their expectations. If you've departed from a runway many times before the surface begins to feel normal. But physics doesn't adapt to familiarity. Now add the runway slope. A sloped runway affects both acceleration and perception. Depending on direction, the airplane may feel like it's gaining speed easily, or struggling without the pilot necessarily recognizing how much energy is actually being built. But slope doesn't change what happens after liftoff. Once airborne, the airplane still needs sufficient airspeed and excess power to climb. The slope can't help you there. And then there's the environment beyond the runway. Just past the departure end are trees approximately 70 to 80 feet tall, close enough that the airplane must demonstrate a healthy climb almost immediately after liftoff. 
This is not a runway where the airplane can lift off, remain in ground effect, and gradually build speed over open terrain. Here the takeoff must produce not just lift, but margin. So when we step back and look at this runway as a system, something becomes clear. This environment doesn't forgive hesitation. It doesn't forgive inefficiency. And it doesn't forgive small miscalculations. It demands that the airplane be performing well before it leaves the ground. One of the most dangerous illusions in aviation is the idea that performance problems announce themselves clearly. They rarely do. An airplane that is accelerating slowly doesn't feel broken. An airplane that lifts off late doesn't feel unsafe yet. An airplane with marginal climb performance still flies. And that's what makes this phase of flight so treacherous. By the time the airplane reveals that it doesn't have enough performance, it's often already airborne committed and out of options. This is why takeoff accidents are so often survivable until they're not. There's a long stretch of time where everything appears acceptable, and then suddenly there isn't enough altitude or energy left to change the outcome. Up to this point in the accident sequence, nothing dramatic has happened. The airplane is intact, the engine is producing power, the pilot is in control, but the margin, the invisible buffer between success and failure, is already being quietly consumed. And now, one final factor enters the picture. A factor that tends to be underestimated precisely because it often feels harmless. That's where we'll go next. At some point before the airplane began its takeoff roll, one decision quietly reshaped everything that followed. The aircraft departed with a tailwind. This is not a dramatic decision. In fact, it's one that pilots make more often than they realize, especially at familiar airfields, especially when winds appear light, and especially when there's no clear visual cue that conditions are unfavorable. From the cockpit, a tailwind can be surprisingly difficult to detect. The airplane still accelerates. The engine sounds normal. There is no warning light that tells the pilot the margins are shrinking. But aerodynamically, tailwinds are unforgiving. An airplane does not lift off based on how fast it moves across the ground. It lifts off based on airspeed, the speed of the air flowing over the wings. A tailwind reduces that airflow for any given ground speed, meaning the airplane must travel farther and faster over the ground to reach the same flying speed. This is where performance quietly erodes. There is a commonly taught rule of thumb that helps pilots visualize this effect. Each knot of tailwind can increase takeoff distance by roughly 3-5%. to that may not sound significant at first, but the key is that this increase applies to the entire takeoff roll. And critically, it doesn't replace other penalties. It stacks on top of them. So now the airplane is accelerating on grass, which already reduces acceleration, and at the same time, it's chasing a higher ground speed target before it can lift off. This is why tailwind takeoffs often feel deceptively normal right up until they don't. According to the wreckage path and impact location, the Sundowner became airborne approximately 2,300 feet into the takeoff roll. That detail matters because it tells us something about energy, not just distance. By the time the airplane left the ground, much of the runway had already been consumed, and with it much of the opportunity to build excess airspeed. At that point, the takeoff had transitioned from a ground problem into an energy problem. This brings us to the most important aerodynamic lesson in this accident. Becoming airborne does not mean the airplane is safe. It only means the wheels are no longer touching the ground. What determines safety after liftoff is how much excess energy the airplane has available energy that can be traded for climb maneuvering and obstacle clearance. A late liftoff almost always tells a story. It suggests the airplane reached flying speed with little margin above stall. It suggests there was limited excess power available for climb, and it suggests that acceleration efficiency was already compromised before the airplane ever left the runway. In simple terms, the airplane was flying, but only just. This is where the concept of climb gradient becomes critical. Climb performance is not about whether the airplane can climb at all. It's about how steeply it can climb relative to obstacles ahead. An airplane with healthy margins lifts off, accelerates slightly, and then converts excess airspeed into altitude. That surplus gives the pilot time and options. But an airplane that lifts off late often has no surplus to work with. It is already operating close to its limits, and any demand gusts turbulence or terrain pushes it past what it can deliver. In this case, trees approximately 70 to 80 feet tall stood just beyond the departure end of the runway, 
There was no extended clear area where the airplane could remain in ground effect and gradually build speed. Once airborne, the aircraft was committed. At low altitude, low airspeed, and with insufficient climb performance, there are no meaningful recovery options. Turning back is not viable. Accelerating takes altitude that isn't available. Lowering the nose risks contact with terrain. Nothing dramatic has to happen for the outcome to be sealed. The airplane simply continues forward climbing, but not fast enough. And that's what makes late liftoff accidents so deceptive. They don't look like failures. They look like flights that just never quite worked. The NTSB concluded that the probable cause of this accident was the pilot's decision to depart with a tailwind from a soft grass runway resulting in insufficient takeoff performance. What's critical to understand is that this was not a single obvious mistake. It was a gradual erosion of margin where each factor made the next one more dangerous. Grass increased rolling resistance. Soft or uneven ground reduced acceleration efficiency. A tailwind raised the required ground speed for liftoff. And obstacles beyond the runway demanded immediate climb performance. Individually, each of these factors might seem manageable. Together, they left the airplane with no flexibility. This is why takeoff accidents are so unforgiving. Unlike cruise flight, where small errors can be corrected over time, takeoff compresses every decision into a narrow window where there is little room to adapt. Once the airplane passed the point where stopping was no longer possible, the outcome depended entirely on whether sufficient energy had already been built. In this case, it hadn't. And that's the central lesson here. The airplane didn't stall. It didn't lose power. It didn't suffer a mechanical failure. It simply reached a moment where required performance exceeded available performance. And by the time that became visible, the airplane was already out of runway, out of altitude, and out of options. After all, accidents like this are difficult to study because they feel so ordinary. The airplane is familiar. The field is familiar. The departure feels routine. But that's exactly why they matter. Because aviation safety is not just about avoiding rare failures. It's about recognizing when small, reasonable decisions begin to stack up and knowing when the margin is quietly slipping away. This sundowner didn't fail. It simply reached the limits of what physics would allow. And understanding where those limits lie is one of the most important skills a pilot can have. That's all for this episode. Thank you for watching. Tell me your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more Aviaton updates.